church on Easter Sunday. It's about the best gig you can get in the entire year. So I'm grateful for your time. And it's going to be wonderful to look into the story uh, of Thomas that we heard in the reading uh, just a moment ago. I'm going to pray for us and then we'll, we'll do that. Father, please this evening, by your spirit, open our hearts to your word and show us Christ. Amen. Amen. Have you ever suffered from FOMO? Anyone struggle with FOMO? Yeah? Anyone know what FOMO means? What does it stand for? Fear of missing out. That's right. This is a modern acronym for a universal human experience. I think people have always probably struggled with FOMO, uh, but these days maybe a bit more uh, with constant posting and filters and everyone having a great time and everything looking wonderful, uh, people eating nice food and going to great parties and enjoying themselves. You get the sense that everyone else is having a slightly better time than you. And this can become crippling for some people. Um, And I wonder whether Thomas, after the events of what we just read in uh, chapter 20 of John, uh, had a bit of a tinge of FOMO. I wonder if he hung a bit more tightly with the other disciples for a few weeks afterwards, just to make sure that he didn't miss out on anything else. Uh, But we're going to dive into the story, because that's all conjecture. Who who knows what, what Thomas was thinking? And see what John wants us to pick up from this incredible story. We saw this morning an encounter that Jesus, the risen Jesus, had with Mary Magdalene. There are plenty of other encounters that are recorded for us in the New Testament. And here tonight, we're going to home in on this fascinating character, Thomas, and see what happens when he meets the risen Jesus. So if you've got a Bible with you, open it up to chapter 20 of John. It'll be really helpful to you to just follow along as we look back through the story and familiarize ourselves with this. You saw at the beginning of the reading that Marion gave us that that happened on Easter Sunday evening. Um, Jesus met with Mary Magdalene in the morning. Uh, His day's work wasn't done, though, and he appears to the disciples and completely blows them away. In the evening, the door is locked. They're they're terrified. They're not sure what to make of this. We we hear in the other Gospels they really weren't convinced by what Mary uh, and the women were telling them about Jesus being risen from the dead. And then Jesus appears, kind of without being invited, through a locked door and really surprises them. And they are astonished. They are also overjoyed. And I think that probably doesn't sum up quite how they felt. They, they were probably bouncing off the ceiling, kind of smiles as, as wide as their faces, to see that Jesus wasn't dead. Jesus is alive. And I say the disciples were there. Most of the disciples were there. Because as you see in our reading, Thomas missed out. This is maybe where the FOMO comes from. So look at verse 24 of uh, chapter 20. We read there, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And we don't know where Thomas was. He might have popped out for a pint of milk or for a jog. or Who knows what was going on, but he wasn't there. He, he missed out. Jesus appeared, and he wasn't there. And I mean, this is, this is missing out big time, right? I mean, if you, if you miss a good party, or your friends go out for a meal and it's great, or happen to bump into a celebrity and take a few photos and it's really exciting, I mean, that's, that's a shame. If you miss the risen Son of God when he appears to all your other friends and you're not there, that is seriously missing out. And and Thomas misses out. And so the disciples, who must have just been wanting to talk about this and tell people, as soon as they see Thomas, they can't keep quiet. Look at verse 25. The other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. I can imagine they, they ran up to him. There's an exclamation mark there. Sometimes punctuation just isn't enough. You want kind of five or six exclamation marks there, don't you? We've seen the Lord. Jesus is alive. The women were right. He is risen from the dead. Literally, physically, bodily, he is alive. And how does Thomas respond? Thomas responds probably in the way that lots of us would likely respond, yeah? He's a skeptic. Halfway through verse 25. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, are these the words of someone who is genuinely searching, who's open to truth and is just laying out for them the kind of evidence he would like to see before believing? I don't think so. The way I read this, the way I try to kind of get inside the head of Thomas, it seems to me that he is a pretty 
committed skeptic. He's pretty content in his view. As far as he can see, these people have gone nuts. Maybe they're just missing Jesus. Maybe they've just gone crazy. But they can't be serious, can they? And so Thomas, with a fair dose of arrogance, says, look, I'm going to have to see the nail marks. I'm going to have to stick my fist literally into the wound in his side before I believe for a second what you're telling me here. I don't think Thomas thought there was any chance at all that he would see Jesus in the way that they were describing. I don't think he believed for a second that he would experience the kind of evidence that he is asking for in in verse 25 there. Anyway, John's story just jumps a week now. The next thing he tells us in verse 26 is about seven days later, the next Sunday uh, in the evening. And what happened in between? You, you wonder sometimes. The, the Gospels are sometimes so sparse, aren't they? They tell you a little bit, and, and you wish they told you more. Uh, you wish they gave you more details, and, and it's just not the way they are. It's the, the way these stories were formed. That They're so sparse in the way they're created. But what happened in between? I mean, what did Thomas do? Did he, did he just get on with life, um, go back to his job? Did he kind of entertain the thought at all? Did he follow up that conversation with the disciples and ask for more information? Did he go and talk to the women and ask for their take on it? Did he go for a little trot around Jerusalem and and go and see the tomb and see the stone rolled away? Were these questions whirring around in his head or did he just bury them deep down and, and try not to think about them at all? I mean, we don't know, do we? We don't know what was going through this man's head as he was trying to come to terms with what his friends were claiming and what he simply couldn't believe. But whatever happened for Thomas in the intervening days, John picks up the story in verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. You see what John's doing here. He's retelling the story to show us that this is basically an action replay. This is almost exactly the same as what happened a week earlier. Same day of the week, same time of the day, same room, same circumstances, the door's locked. Same thing happens. Jesus arrives without being invited and just walks through the wall or through a door or something. Well, even, I mean, that would be another place to have a bit more detail. That would be really nice, wouldn't it? But, but Jesus just comes into the room, even though the door is locked. And he uses the same greeting. John writes it down for us because it's significant. The only difference, really, between Easter Sunday and a week on is that Thomas is there this time. And you can imagine the look on his face, can't you? As he was there hanging out with his friends, these other disciples, he, the skeptic, is confronted with Jesus alive. And Jesus says these famous words to him, verse 37. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. This is classic Jesus, isn't it? He meets people where they are and he engages them with what they need to be engaged with. And for Thomas, he had quite confidently set out the kind of criteria he would need in order to believe. He put forward, here's the evidence I want to see. If I'm going to trust what you're saying is true, I want to put my hand in his side. You imagine the wound to put a hand inside the side of Jesus. And so Jesus says, go on then, Thomas. <laughs> Can I have a poke around? See, see if I really am alive. See if this really isn't a ghost. And there's that famous um, image, you might have seen it, a famous painting, I think it's by Caravaggio, it's, a, it's kind of a dark canvas with Thomas in the center lit up, and he's poking around in, in, in the side of Jesus, or in, or in his hands. But I don't imagine that's how the scene happened. I mean, again, just trying to understand what might have been going on in this man's head. See, I, I don't think he was genuinely looking to believe in Jesus, I think he was convinced that this couldn't happen. It was a flippant comment almost, wasn't it? Show me his hands, show me his side, then I'll believe. He was never expecting to actually see Jesus with the, the, the hole in his side and the holes in his hands and in his feet. And confronted with Jesus, 
the risen Son of God. Do you think he went for a little poke around just to check that it was him, just to check it's not a fake? Of course he didn't. I mean, we're not told that explicitly, but you read the story and the impression you get is this man is on his face in front of Jesus. All his arrogance is instantly deflated as he meets the risen Lord. I mean, we don't know what he did. We don't know whether that image by Caravaggio ever happened, but we know what he said. Look at Thomas's words. This is the next thing that John wants us to pick up. In verse 28, Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Throughout John's gospel, different characters kind of come into the story and they they address Jesus in different ways. And and sometimes Jesus has been called Lord. Um, This morning when we listened to the story of Mary Magdalene, um, she describes him as Rabboni, teacher. But no one up until this point has called him God. But here, Thomas, when he sees Jesus risen from the dead, Jesus who has fought with death and risen victoriously, who has defeated death forever, his conclusion is that Jesus is God. And the way John pulls his story together is fascinating. What a genius John was, the way he he tells this story. Because he remembers this moment that happened where he was in the room watching all this happening, seeing how Thomas responded, the words that Thomas chose to describe Jesus as he saw him in front of him. And he thinks, well, that would be a great way to conclude this, this gospel. Because actually, it's the way that John begins his gospel, isn't it? Just If you've got a Bible with me, turn back to, to John chapter 1. The very first words of, of this gospel. John's slightly enigmatic here. He's a bit mysterious. And he starts off with describing this character, this power called the Word. He says in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And just skip down to verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Then one more little skip down to verse 18. No one has ever seen God But the one and only Son, who is himself God, is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. John, all the way through his story, one of the things he's doing is revealing God to us. He's making the point as clearly and as powerfully as he can that this Jesus is not just a good teacher. Like Marion was saying, he's not just a nice guy. He's not just a nice idea. He is God in a human body. God walking around and talking to people and eating with people and teaching and doing miracles. This is God. Catch a glimpse of Jesus and you have caught a glimpse of God. See what Jesus is like and you discover what God is like. And here is the the whole gospel kind of grinds into its conclusion. Thomas realizes what John has been banging on about from the very beginning of this gospel, that Jesus is God. And what does he look like? He's a king who voluntarily gave up his life for a world that hated him to rescue them and to free them from sin and from Satan and from death. But he's not just a king who died. He's a king who defeated death and rose again. And now he stands in front of Thomas. And Thomas sees with more clarity than he's ever seen before in his life that this, this is what God looks like. God is revealed to us in the risen Lord Jesus. It's funny, isn't it? Sometimes people make quite big demands of God. I'll believe if dot, 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 dot. I'll look at the evidence and see whether, what I make of it. Often we come with a, a fair amount of confidence in our own ability to weigh things up and to come to decent conclusions. The amount of people who've made those kinds of claims like Thomas did and come to the point where all they can do is declare Jesus God. I mean, there's a lot of intelligent, wise, skilled people who've, who've made that journey. 
often when it comes to the resurrection, actually. You can pick up books of people who, who have come as skeptics to this idea of the resurrection, really intent on disproving it. And as they look at the facts, as they explore the history, as they try to compose some sort of argument against the Christian belief in resurrection, they reach the point where all they can do is fall on their faces in worship before Jesus and admit that he really did raise from the dead. I mean, we're talking barristers, we're talking historians, wise, intelligent, skilled people. I mean, Peter talked a little bit this morning, didn't he, about the evidence for the resurrection. As people have explored this through the decades, through the centuries, so many have become convinced of the deity of Jesus and the truthfulness of his resurrection as a result. And that's exactly what happens to Thomas here. That's the last thing we hear of Thomas, well, the last words we hear from the mouth of Thomas in this gospel. But Jesus has the the final words in, in this scene. In verse 29, Jesus turns to Thomas and he says this, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And quite often people read this and they think that this is a bit of a a kind of rebuke to Thomas. This is Jesus slapping him down a bit. And and it could be a bit of that, but but most of the commentators I've been reading this week have, have said really what it's all about is an encouragement to the vast majority of us who don't have the experience that Thomas has had here. I mean, 99.99999 something percent of Christians throughout the centuries haven't had this kind of visual experience of Jesus that Thomas and the other disciples had. They haven't met the risen Lord Jesus in this way. And so you could come to the conclusion that your faith is a kind of second-rate faith, a sub-par faith, because you haven't had that kind of incredible experience of Jesus, that kind of appearance from Jesus to you. And so Jesus makes the point, I, I think for the benefit of people like you and me, for the benefit of us, he makes the point that actually we are the blessed ones. And you might wonder how that is. But, but as we see how the, the story of the New Testament unfolds from this point, we, we realize actually, I think, what Jesus is talking about here. Because Thomas, in this, this experience of Jesus he had here, saw Jesus. He could see the, the marks in his hands and the, the wound in his side. And that would have been a pretty powerful imp- experience to have that would have left an impression on him wouldn't it but our experience of the risen Jesus is different and the New Testament tells us greater because you and me if we're, if we're Christians this evening we experience Jesus not just at a, at a distance maybe even a distance of a meter but Jesus in us and Jesus with us by his spirit Th- this evening if you are a Christian You are the dwelling place of Jesus. You are where he lives here on planet Earth, by his spirit. He is with you. He is inside you. He is changing you. And that, friends, is something which even Thomas didn't experience at this point. Even when he could feel the breath of Jesus on him, he didn't know the experience of Jesus in him, Jesus with him, like a Christian today experiences. You know, me and you, we are more blessed than Thomas was on that evening, a week on from Easter Sunday. But but that might seem like a very kind of wishy-washy, experiential, kind of blind faith. Do do you think, I mean, a lot of people make that kind of claim. Uh, And lots of people would be way more in the camp of of Thomas back in verse 25. You know, when he's kind of lost his mind at this point, surely, in this story. In 25, at least he's saying, I want to see some evidence. I'm not going to believe until I see kind of hard, um, concrete evidence for for Jesus being alive. And that's actually where where John goes next in, in this little bit of his gospel. Because in verses 30 and 31, he says this. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Our faith isn't a a blind faith. We might not have the same evidence that Thomas had, but we have enough evidence to believe. 
John has carefully constructed his own experience and other eyewitness accounts into this story. And that fits into the mosaic of Matthew and Mark and Luke to make a well-rounded account of what happened when Jesus bodily, physically, literally rose from the dead. We are not just basing a blind faith on feelings and butterflies in our stomach. Here we have a historical account based on eyewitnesses that is solid enough that is concrete enough for us to put our trust in, to believe in. That's the point of this. This is the reason John, I mean, it must have taken a long time to write a gospel. I've never tried, but it must be pretty hard work. And John goes to all that effort so that people will hear this message and believe, so that people will take these accounts of the life of Jesus and believe them. Another way you could uh, translate that word believe is trust, so that people will trust them, put their trust in the one that they speak about, in the in the name of Jesus. Peter, this morning, if, do listen back to this morning's sermon. Peter talked a lot about the evidence for the resurrection. That when people have tried to construct an alternative way of, of putting the facts together that leads to a different conclusion than that Jesus rose from the dead, it just doesn't work. Someone stealing the body or Jesus never really dying or anything else that you might think about, they just don't stack up as explanations of the historical facts. And so, so many people have come to the conclusion that the most unlikely explanation is actually the most credible explanation. That Jesus really did rise from the dead. That this evening, as on this evening, when, T- uh, when Thomas met Jesus, Jesus is alive. And, and so, we are given these accounts. I'd encourage you, read them, think about them, interact with them, talk about them with people. Discuss them, really take them to heart and see for yourself, does it make sense? Is there any other way of of putting the facts together than to accept that Jesus has risen from the dead? And the conclusion which Thomas came to, the conclusion which the other disciples came to, that the early church has come to, that thousands upon thousands upon millions of followers of Jesus have come to through the centuries and through the millennia is that he has risen. That's what John was doing in this book, that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And let me just be clear here. We are not talking about believing that this is a nice story or believing that this is a powerful myth that can kind of shape the way that we think and the way that we behave. This is belief in the literal resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That is what Thomas experienced. That is what all true Christians have to come to. One one poet put it like this. Make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecules re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. It was not as the flowers, each soft spring recurrent, It was not as his spirit in the mouths of fuddled and fuddled eyes of the eleven apostles. It was as flesh. The same hinged thumbs and toes, the same valved heart that pierced, died, withered, paused, and then regathered out of the enduring might, new strength to enclose. Let us not mock God with a metaphor, analogy, sidestepping transcendence, making of the event a parable, a sign painted in the faded credulity of earlier ages, let us walk through the door. The stone is rolled back, not papier-mâché, not a stone in a story, but a vast rock of materiality that in the slow grinding of time will eclipse for each of us the wide light of day. This was a literal Jesus, a literal death, a literal rising, a literal stone rolled away. This is what we're talking about here. And this evening, I'm encouraging you to believe this because it changes everything. And can I just point you to the thing that John wants us to see? I mean, the implications for the resurrection are vast, unending. They change everything. And and, and just a little plug, actually, if I can. Over the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at this. We're getting into a a series looking at the theology of the resurrection. 
the, the, the contribution that the resurrection makes to the gospel. Sometimes we major on the cross and, and we lose sight of what part the resurrection plays. So do come back for the next five weeks and, and think more about that. But, but John has one thing in his sights here. Just look back at, at verse 20, uh, sorry, chapter 20 of John. And in verse 31, he says, These things have been written, this account of the life of Jesus culminating in the resurrection. These things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is what's on offer here. This is what is at stake. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then the one who fought death and conquered death offers life to you too. For anyone who trusts him, Life is available, and not just a nice notion or a a warm, fuzzy feeling, but the same tangible, touchable, literal life beyond death that Jesus models for us here. It was beautiful to hear Marion talk about the way that Don is with the Lord. And actually, that incredible experience of being with the Lord in paradise now is not even the end of what the Bible describes for those who trust Jesus. Because when Jesus returns, when the new creation dawns, what we saw as prototype in Jesus will become reality for everyone who trusts in him. Physical, literal, bodily resurrection for everyone, for all eternity, if they trust in Jesus. Now, if there was ever an occasion for a tinge of FOMO, it's now, right? We should have a sense of fear that we might miss out on this. This is, this is too good to miss out on. If there is the possibility, the opportunity of life beyond death, if this evening, as it were, Jesus comes to you and says, accept life, Come to me, trust me, believe that I am risen and receive life, eternal life beyond death. If that is what is on offer, aren't you a little worried that you might miss out? But of course, the, the good news is that anyone can receive this gift. All it takes is to trust him. All it takes is to believe. To believe that Jesus is alive to trust him with your life and with your death. Just a bit earlier in the gospel, probably a couple of weeks before these events with Thomas, Jesus is comforting a friend of his whose whose brother has died, and, and he says these famous words. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus asks a question next, and I want to put this question to you as we close. Do you believe this? Should we pray? Father, I pray that you would open our eyes this evening as as Thomas had his eyes open to see Jesus as he really is, as our Lord and our God, as the Messiah, the true King of all the world, and as the one who defeated death. Thank you that Jesus is alive. And Lord, we praise you that because he lives, he is able to offer life to all who trust him. Lord, I pray for each of us here that we would believe in the resurrection of Jesus and that we would trust him, not just now, but with our death, in the hope of resurrection. Father, thank you so much that Jesus is alive. Thank you that in him we can live too. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a song of worship now. It's a wonderful hymn.